there, tech enthusiasts. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Tech Talks with J Square. I'm your host, Jetta Jones. I have been in the IT industry for over 27 years now. Yes, I'm considered an OG. The last 16 years, I've worked as a SAN engineer, helping organizations store, manage, and secure their vast amounts of data. And I have worked at many major companies throughout my career. Hewlett Packard, Procter & Gamble, UPS, Georgia Pacific, just to name a few. It has been over 11 years since I did my last sand video right here on this YouTube channel. That video got over 412,000 views and counting from around the world. I am forever grateful for each of you that watched that video and supported me. For many of you, this is the first time you're seeing my face on camera. So now you can put a face to the voice. Hello again, YouTube. I'm Jetta Jones. So today I'm going to do a brand new mini lesson on introduction to SANS. The fundamentals I covered in my initial video, they're still the same, but I'm going to share with you some new exciting updates as it relates to storage area networks and the modern IT infrastructure. You know, technology is always changing. Storage area networks are still used as on-prem storage by many organizations, despite the popularity of the cloud for a number of reasons. Data control and security, compliancy, disaster recovery, maybe they're running a legacy infrastructure. And in most cases, you have more predictable costs with on-prem storage. So in fact, many enterprises use both the cloud and on-prem storage, creating a hybrid cloud model. This allows them to leverage the strengths of both technologies. So let's dive a little deeper, watch the video to its entirety, make sure you like it, make sure you leave me a comment, ask me questions, give me recommendations for things that you want me to cover in the future. Let's get started. So first we wanna start off by defining what is a storage area network or a SAN for short. So a SAN is simply a specialized, dedicated high-speed network that allows multiple servers to use shared storage resources. It's much more scalable and much more efficient. So what are the common storage resources or hardware components that make up a SAN? They include a storage array, these are the most common use case. And think of a storage array as a collection or network of hard drives. And the second most common component includes a tape library or a tape drive. So we are going to talk about this in greater detail. And I'm also going to do a mini whiteboard lesson to bring this all together for you. So we're going to talk about some of the many benefits of a SAN. So SANs are excellent for helping organizations to improve their storage performance. They're highly scalable and they have advanced features such as high availability. So organizations run their most critical workloads on a storage area network because they can be very costly to implement because they require specialized hardware. In most cases, they are somewhat complex to manage and you need specialized technical resources to manage and maintain a storage area network. So you find these in many enterprise organizations because of these type of capabilities. So you have improved data availability. So SANS provide highly available storage solutions that can be accessed simultaneously by multiple servers that are running various operating systems. So Unix, Windows, Linux, Sun Solaris, it does not matter. And most of the components that make up a storage area network are redundant. This makes it highly available, redundant power supplies, redundant storage controllers, and think of the storage controller as the brain of the SAN. It makes sure the right data is only accessible by the right server. There are redundant network interfaces, 
And in most cases, depending on how you have your SAN configured, you can configure RAID, which RAID protects the SAN from disk drive failures, failures. So disk drives are common hardware components that go bad in a SAN. But if you have RAID configured in most cases, you can lose multiple drives at one time without any downtime. Listen, I supported SANS for 16 years as a practitioner and they are, you know, rock solid. They rarely go down. Of course, it depends on the vendor and some vendors have better storage equipment than others, but in general, SANS are rock solid and organizations love it for their mission critical workloads. So fast data access, they're low latency because remember you're offloading the storage processing from internal disk to the server to the SAN. So it needs to be fast data access between the server and the storage because when that server makes a request for the data it needs inside of the SAN, the SAN has to serve that back to that server in a very fast access manner. So it is ideal for like I said earlier, databases and virtualized environments that need that fast access. SANS use fiber channel technology, which is very fast and is highly reliable. Now, organizations can use Ethernet or iSCSI. I don't recommend it because that kind of defeats the purpose of a SAN. And iSCSI uses a traditional Ethernet network, but fiber channel is much better. Better is going to give you that fast data access. So better storage utilization, it goes back to that scalability. So when I talk about scalability, that means you can add additional storage capacity or increase performance as the business needs grow. You know, in some cases you can start off with three or four hard drives and add hard drives to your storage array as your needs change. You can add expansion shelves in many cases to increase your performance. There are things such as storage tiering and storage tiering make sure the right data is on the right type of hard drive. So you want your frequently accessed data to be on high performing disks such as SSDs infrequently accessed data such as archival data that may not be accessed but maybe once a year you want that on slower less expensive disks such as traditional spinning hard drives centralized management this is big for my administrators out there you know being able to easily manage provision storage to servers and monitor your storage environment for performance problems, for uh, failed hardware components. You want to be able to do that through some type of centralized software tool and SANS give you that capability. And then data protection, which also ties into that high availability. So SAN offers, like I said earlier, RAID. You can easily lose a disk or several disks at one time without taking an outage. You can plug and play, you know, if you want to, let's say a hard drive goes bad, you can easily remove that hard drive out, replace it, it rebuilds the data and no downtime. Snapshots, snapshots are point in time copies of your data that sits right there on the primary storage array. This is going to give you that fast access. And, you know, I've seen organizations use snapshots for a number of different things. You know, many vendors now allow snapshots to be used for cyber resiliency, for rapid recovery, if they experience a cyber attack, or also you can use it so users can self-serve. So let's say a user deleted an Excel spreadsheet or one of their files are corrupted. Well, they can go to a snapshot themselves and pull back the known good copy of their file. So snapshots have uh, many different use cases. And I'm going to be doing a future lesson on 
data protection methods. And we're going to go a little bit deeper in many of these capabilities. And then, of course, you know, backups, you can offload your backups from your Ethernet LAN and put that in your storage area network. That's where the tape libraries and tape drives come into play. Replication, copying data from the primary site to maybe the organization has another physical DR site in another city or state. They can copy or replicate their data there. They can replicate their data. Maybe they are renting space in a co-location or they can replicate data to the cloud. So these are some of the advanced data protection capabilities that you get with a SAN. And again, they are costly, but they are worth the cost because think about the amount of money an organization will lose if their mission critical application goes down. This is a big deal. We are going to look at a diagram of a traditional environment that does not utilize a storage area network. So in this environment, we have three servers. All of these servers have an operating system installed, could be Windows, Unix, Linux, it does not matter. Server A is running a virtualization application, could be VMware, Microsoft, Hyper-V, and it has data installed on the local hard drives. Same for server B. Server B is running an Oracle database. Server C also has an OS. It has an CRM application installed and it's storing data local to its internal disk. Well, this design is commonly referred to as direct attached storage or DAS for short. And DAS is simply when a server utilizes a storage system without going through a network such as its internal disk, or it can also have an external storage array directly connected to the back of the server through fiber channel technology or some other type of connection. And we're going to cover DAS at some point in the future because direct attached storage, this model is still used in specific use cases. So I don't want you to think that modern organizations don't use direct attached storage for certain workloads, but in general, it has many disadvantages such as limited scalability. So DAS is typically limited to the storage capacity of the individual device it is connected to. So remember when I said uh, the data is, is installed on the internal disk. So this server A has internal disk. Well, it's not very scalable because only the disk in A can be seen by A. Only the disk in B can be seen by B. Only the disk in C can be seen by C. Remember we talked about one of the biggest benefits of a SAN is the ability for multiple servers to access a shared pool of storage. Well, this is not how a DAS works. And once server A, let's say server A has a maximum storage capacity of 10 terabytes. So once it you reach that 10 terabyte storage capacity, you can't other upgrade very easily, or in some cases you can't upgrade at all. So with a SAN, you can add additional disks. You can start off with as little as three or four disks and then uh, upgrade as the business needs change. You can also add expansion shells for more capacity, but this environment is very, very, siloed. There's also lack of flexibility. So DAS is tied to the host device it is connected to. So let's say server A has two terabytes free. Server B has four terabytes. Server C has four terabytes. Well, let's say server A needed seven terabytes. Well, I have seven terabytes, but guess what? Five terabytes that I need is trap capacity because it's over here on server C and I cannot take this free space and give it to server A. That's not how a DAS work. All of these servers and the storage are siloed and you have trap capacity. So you have that limited flexibility there. 
management complexity. So again, these are silos. These are not easily managed through a single pane of glass. So the great thing about a SAN is that you generally have some type of centralized management tool or maybe some software that's accessed through a GUI that gives you visibility into your SAN environment. You can easily see if there are any hardware component failures. Are there any performance issues? Are there any storage capacity limitations or issues? Or has a server disconnected from my SAN? So you get that single pane of glass visibility into your storage infrastructure and that saves a whole lot of time from a management perspective. Data security concerns. Well, you know, security is always a concern. I don't care if you're using DAS, SAN, NAS, or object storage, you know, and cybersecurity is always a multi-layered multi approach, meaning you have to use multiple tools and processes to make sure your environment is secure. But in a SAN environment, remember you are offloading your data to a separate network and that SAN has way more advanced capabilities and features. So you don't have your operating system and your application and all of your data located on the same device. So that gives you a little bit of security, but keep in mind, you know, security is a multi-layered approach. And then limited redundancy. Now servers have evolved over time, but um, they're not as redundant as a SAN. You know, now you have Blade servers and they do have some redundancy built into it, but SANs are rock solid. I've supported them for the last 16 years of practitioner and they rarely go down. There's redundant power supplies that will kick in if one power supply fails and that Secondary power supply will continue to chug along until you can replace the bad one. You have redundant storage controllers and the controller is the brain of the SAN and you also have redundant network interfaces. You have RAID configuration capabilities that allow you to lose multiple hard drives and that is amazing. So you can lose multiple hard drives without any downtime and also uh, DAS does not have all the advanced storage features that is found in a SAN. So features such as snapshots. Remember, snapshots are point-in-time copies, copies that are stored directly on the primary storage array. Deduplication gets rid of uh, duplicate data on the network to save on your capacity. Compression. You can compress your data in many cases, two to one or three to one. That is going to save you storage capacity. Things such as thin provisioning. And we're going to go into these in a little bit more detail. And then there are also backup and disaster recovery challenges in a traditional environment without a SAN. Again, it speaks to those advanced storage capabilities. Replication, the ability to replicate your data from the primary storage array to some secondary site. It could be a secondary data center. It could be a co-location space that they're renting in a third party vendors data center, or you can replicate data to the cloud for that high availability. So we're going to look at a SAN infrastructure now. So we have multiple servers that are running various flavors of operating systems. Windows, Unix, Linux, Sun Solaris, it does not matter what flavor of operating system these servers are running. And then we have a storage array. Think of a storage array as a collection or network of disks. So it also has redundant components inside of this box like we talked about before, but these are all hard drives, okay? So these servers are no longer using its internal disk for its data. Remember, it has the operating system installed and it's running some type of application or some type of resource, okay, resources. So these servers, the data that it needs is actually stored inside of this storage array. So from this storage array, the SAN 
admin or engineer creates a shared pool of storage. So all of this storage, this storage pool, let's say you have 11 terabytes free. This storage pool is accessible by all of these servers. So you don't have that trap capacitor or the limitations of the internal disk of each of these servers. And you can easily add more hard drives to this storage array. You can add expansion shelves. Like I said, in many cases, most modern storage arrays can support petabytes, hundreds of petabytes worth of data. And all of that storage capacity is available to each of these servers. And the beauty of this is that you can allocate storage to this server, that server, the Unix box, the Sun box, Sun Solaris box. And guess what? If the admin decommissions this box, it can easily add the capacity, the storage that this server was using back to the shared storage pool, making that storage available to the existing servers or new servers they're going to bring online. So this is a traditional storage area network Visio diagram that I created that has a LAN, a SAN, and a WAN. Now these are not competing solution. If an organization is using a storage area network, they are also running a local area network. So, and they have some similarities in a LAN. You have your client machines that go through or connected to an ethernet switch and they utilize resources on these servers, whether it's a file server, a application server, an email server, maybe a CRM database, an Oracle database. And these servers also need network connectivity through Ethernet. And the servers are using a storage area network because that is where its data is being stored and it needs a fiber channel switch. So in an Ethernet environment, you have an Ethernet switch for connectivity. And if the servers are utilizing a storage area network for its storage, it has to go through a fiber channel switch. And this is not always the case, but fiber channel switches give you much more capacity. But remember, storage arrays can also be directly connected to the server. It gets a little bit of a gray area, but most enterprise organizations use fiber channel switches. And I'm going to talk about the components very, very shortly. Okay. And then the shared resources on a SAN, like we talked about earlier, are generally libraries or storage arrays. And most organizations have multiple storage arrays. Okay. We're going to look at the various components that make up a storage area network from a hardware and both a software perspective. So we have a server and in a SAN environment, you always need a server and obviously it's running the operating system and it's also running the application that uses the storage area network for its data. So what do does this server need to access a storage area network? Well, it needs a host bus adapter card and these cards are dual ported so this card gets installed inside of the server, very similar to a ethernet network interface card that you use to connect the server to a LAN. The second component is a fiber channel cable. And this fiber channel cable plugs into each of these ports. Okay, so you have it to each of the ports. And this HBA adapter is installed inside of the server. And then you have multi-pathing software that is installed on the server as well. And the multi-pathing software is for redundancy. So remember, the server needs to get to that storage array to access its data. 
and it needs multiple paths to do so. So just think about if you were driving to work, okay, and maybe your normal route is congested, you can't get to work. Well, guess what? You can take an alternate path to get to the same destination. And this is what the multi-pathing software does. It manages that redundancy. So the server can always have another path in case something happens to path A, it has path B to get to its data. So then you have a uh, fiber channel switch A. So this server, once it has the host bus adapter card installed, it's all cabled up. It has the multi-pathing software installed locally. So then the cable, the other end of the fiber channel cable is going to a port on the switch, okay? And then um, the next component obviously is the external storage array. And the external storage array is also going to a port on the switch. So this is considered fabric A. If I can write that, not sure, I'm not really good with this tool, so forgive me. And then you have a secondary switch. Well, these switches are not connected to each other. They don't even know about each other, okay? They don't even know about each other. This is strictly for redundancy purposes. So that second port in the cable is going to this switch. So this is that alternate path that I was talking about. And then the storage array also has an alternate path. So this is all types of redundancy built in. So you have this route that this server can take to get to the storage. And then you have this route the server can take to get to the storage, okay? So that is where the redundancy comes in. And remember, these switches are not connected. This is considered fabric A, and this second switch is considered fabric B. So you can think of this as redundant SANS inside of a SANS. So I hope this made sense to you. If it doesn't, you have any questions, make sure you drop me a comment below and I'll be more than happy to clarify. But for simplicity purposes, this is what a SAN architecture looks like. Obviously, you're going to have multiple servers, but each one of those servers need an HBA adapter. They need fiber channel cables. They're running multi-pathing uh, software. Each of those servers have redundant paths, one path, uh, one connection going to a port on switch A, another connection going to a port on switch B, and also the storage array has redundancy. One cable, and keep in mind this storage array also has fiber channel ports as well. So it has a connection to switch A and a connection to switch B. So let's say switch B goes down. There's still this path that the server can take to get to the data, therefore your storage area network is not gonna experience any downtime, whether a port goes bad on one of the switches or the entire switch itself goes down, you still have alternate path and that is managed through the multi-pathing software. So we're going to look at the future trends of SANS and I am so excited to talk about this. You know, when I did my lecture, 11 years ago, all the fundamentals that I discussed are still the same, but you know, technology has evolved and the future of storage area networks looks very, very promising as they continue to evolve and adapt to changing technologies and business needs. You think about AI and machine learning, you know, is that technology has been around for quite some time, but now organizations are adapting and they're figuring out how can I incorporate AI and machine learning into my business processes to drive better business outcomes. So the first trend, AI and machine learning is being used in storage area networks to optimize SAN performance. We talked about tiering, you can use AI for auto tiering of data. 
to make sure the right data is on the right physical disk. So imagine there's data sitting out there on your SAN that has not been accessed for a couple years. So AI sees that and says, you know what? Let's automatically move that data to lower performing, lower cost disks, such as traditional hard drives. And also AI is being used for predictive analytics for storage capacity planning, predicting hardware failures. So this allows the organization to be more proactive versus reactive. Imagine if you can predict a hardware failure before it even becomes an issue. That is amazing. Hybrid cloud integration. Well, most organizations are still running on-prem storage despite the popularity of the cloud. And you may say, well, why do organizations need uh, data on-prem and they need data in the cloud? Well, some organizations have to keep certain data on-prem for compliancy and regulatory reasons, and they may uh, move certain workloads to the cloud. The cloud uh, technology is highly, highly scalable. I knew I said SANS are scalable, and they are, but cloud is very, very, very scalable. So they may want to move certain workloads there, or they may be replicating data on-prem to a DR in the cloud, or they may be utilizing cloud backups or something like that. So it's important as organizations adopt hybrid cloud strategies, SANS will need to integrate with cloud services. So this uh, integration between these two operating environments on-prem and in the cloud, SANS need to provide a unified storage solution so data can easily move between these two operating environment. So data and cyber resiliency, this is a big one. So when I talked about SANS 11 years ago, cyber attacks really was not that prevalent. But today you have ransomware and the threat landscape is ever evolving. So as SANS become more integrated with cloud services and other networks, and also as SAN technology becomes more advanced itself, security will be a major concern. It's actually a major concern today, especially like I said, but ransomware. So SAN vendors will need to continue to develop and enhance security features to protect against data breaches and other security threats. And today, some arrays from vendors like IBM are now allowing immutable backups and when I say immutable, that means backups that can't be altered, changed, or deleted, can't be seen by hackers. So it allows backups to be taken and stored on the primary storage for that fast recovery. So these backups are immutable and they are logically air gap. So what do I mean by air gap? Air gaps, an air gap backup is simply isolating your backup from the primary source. So you can do a physical air gap. So let's say you uh, do your backups on a tape cartridge and you send that cartridge to some offsite storage or you take that cartridge out of the drive and sit it on a shelf somewhere in the same data center where it's not on a network. That is a physical air gap. But companies such as IBM have created logically air gaps that are immutable backups sitting right there on the primary storage. And what that is going to give you is that fast recovery time because on average, if an organization has a cyber attack, it can take anywhere from 23 to 24 days to recover from a cyber attack. Imagine a business being down for 23 or 24 days. And guess what? That's only after you have discovered you have been breached. There is a dwell period. So a dwell period is the time that an organization has been breached to the time they realize they have been compromised. And that can, sometimes that dwell period can be days to weeks to months. So once you figure it out, you've been breached, then you got to figure out how am I going to recover? That can take 23 to 24 days. So cyber resiliency is very, very important because you have to have that rapid recovery. 
scalability and elasticity. So scalability, dynamic resource allocation. So SANS of the future are likely to become more elastic by allowing dynamic resource allocation, meaning I can dynamically allocate more storage capacity to my servers without manual intervention by a storage admin or SAN engineer. And this allows um, organizations to allocate and deallocate stored resources on the fly, similar to what cloud storage's uh, capabilities. So this happens automatically. I see that this server is near its capacity. You can use dynamic allocation to automatically give it more storage capacity as the workloads needs change on the fly. And then automation and orchestration, being able to automate provisioning and deployment of storage resources, you know, being able to resize and create storage LUNs and decommission storage volumes on the fly without any manual intervention. I think this is where we will be going in the future. And then software defined storage. I don't know whether you've heard of SDS and many of the new storage arrays already have this capability. So software defined storage decouples the hardware, that storage array from the software Storage arrays also have storage software running on them. And this storage software, through updates, you can get additional capabilities without upgrading your hardware. So let's say you have a storage array that does not support what I talked about earlier, immutable backups and logically air gap backups that sit on the primary storage. Maybe your current array, the hardware doesn't support that, but through a software update, you can add those capabilities and features. And think about if you use an iPhone, you know, Apple refreshes the hardware, but they are always releasing software updates that gives your existing iPhone additional capabilities. Well, software defined storage works very, very similar. So. Overall, the future of SANS are likely to be shaped by the needs of greater integration with the cloud, you know, the adoption of new storage technologies, being able to uh, incorporate more capabilities through AI and machine learning. And of course, security is going to be a big one. So I look forward to seeing what the next 11 years bring. It's going to be exciting. Okay, this is the end of the lecture and I want to thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, share and hit that notification bell. Leave me a comment. Let me know what topics you want me to cover on the next video. Let me know if you have any questions about what I covered on this mini lesson. And until next time, I will see you later, tech enthusiasts.